We're going to go about this a different way than I typically do. We we put a question out on how people would like this to be addressed. And so we're going to go at this from a completely different way. Instead of talking about all the intricacies of, of Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease, we're going to go more at this from a mode of how do you, what are the real keys to heal from this? So I will address Lyme disease. It might seem like I'm ignoring that. I'm going to address that close to the end uh, to bring all this into perspective. But um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so we've been working with Lyme disease for quite a few years and we've seen every type of nightmare you could possibly have with the bulk of those people healing and what we run it what we found through the course of doing this there are several different barriers that people have that they get hung up in where they can't heal and the first one of those is is nutrition. There are several different aspects of nutrition that people have problems with, but we're going to approach nutrition. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to approach everything tonight from a very different perspective. So bear with me. It might seem a little odd at first, but I'm going to make it that way on purpose. Um, because we have to have a whole different understanding with nutrition. Uh, we, we really need to have a different concept of relating to our food. And with this, this is a picture of an atom right here. Most of us have seen pictures of atoms in school or other places. And seeing this picture reminds me of an opening lecture I had in, in graduate school where the microbiology teacher said 50% of what you're going to learn in the school is false information. Everybody sat up in their chair. That really got me quite awake. And she said, the problem is we're going to teach you everything that we know now to be true. The time's going to prove out that 50% of what we teach in the body of science is not going to be true. It's going to be up to you people to keep up with a body of scientific knowledge to really see what part is true and what part isn't. And in looking at that, I don't have the slide in here, but 40% of the world literature put out as far as scientific papers is falsified with what's called spin. In America, it's suspected that 70% of the scientific information in the most reputable journals and textbooks and all that is falsified. They have done studies to figure out uh, why that's falsified. 75% of the articles with spin on them is overt fraud. And that usually ties into somebody's getting paid under the table. And when we look at a study, it's really important when they're just saying what everybody expects them to say to find out who fund, funded that. So when we look at this picture of an atom, <clears throat> almost everything that I learned in chemistry and all that ends up being not true. So in graduate school levels of, of chemistry, if what I found out is not true, what the common person has found out really isn't very true either. And it comes down to a point where when we look at quantum physics, and I'm a bit thirsty, so I'm going to have some tea. When we look at quantum physics, all the parts of an atom are made up of spins of light. That ties us back into the beginning of time in Genesis with creation, where God spoke things into his existence. Part of his nature is light. He gave part of his nature to make things come together. And that light has these little spins in them that create an electromagnetic frequency. Um, we were always told the, the parts in the outer orbit 
of the atom were electrons and those have a negative charge. Inside the nucleus is protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons are neutral. Well, it comes to, to Bayer, one of the contemporaries of Albert Einstein, uh, when Albert Einstein came up with a theory of relativity where E equals mc squared, which is with mass is actually part of light, um, one of his contemporaries asked him, so what's that mean to the common person? And Albert looked at him and said, well, that's for you to, to figure out. And he, he looks at chemistry at, at atoms like this as electromagnetic generators. And for nutrition, that's really key because the primary thing we get out of nutrition is energy. And these atoms are little electromagnetic generators. In a normal state, it's true, the, the, the things that orbit around the outside, those are electrons. But if it's a anion form, what the, the, the nucleus is negative and the shell is orbiting positive charges. So <clears throat> it, it took quite a bit for my head to wrap around that because it's so different from what I was taught. But when we, when we look at the atoms, when they start to combine with other atoms, the normal, um, uh, I just remember this. You can move me around your screen, and it's probably best to put me up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Just grab your mouse and move, move my screen over there. When atoms combine, they make these hybrid orbits that aren't circles. They're like this. They're more like uh, teardrops. And in reality, the atom will come, it'll, or the, let's say the electron, it'll come, it'll spin, do a small spin over here as a recovery, come out over here, and then it will switch to the other atom, do a spin over here. And, and <clears throat> the, the point of that is, I guess you probably can't see my mouse on there. The point of that is we don't have these, um, circular movements of, of the electromagnetic uh, currents going across atoms. They become these teardrop things that share back and forth. And as they do that, it creates this pulsing and a vibration. That vibration of atoms is unique to not just, not just something like water two atoms of hydrogen, one of oxygen, but that water will have a different frequency in every unique species of every living thing on the face of the earth. And what, what changes that frequency, about 80% of that change happens in our liver and about 20% happens outside of that. The liver in a plant is down right below the roots and it does the same thing. So this thing of energy and this pulsation of energy is really, really key in understanding of nutrition if we're going to have a, a proper understanding of it. So we take this and we start to look at something like a protein. Protein is this convoluted, there's certainly a sequence of atoms in a specific order, and that'll be the case in every species that's out there but how it folds and how it bends and the frequency in you know, which it vibrates is unique to every single species. This formation, uh, putting together and the bending of it and the vibration, 80% of that happens inside a liver. When we look at it more of a graphic form, the last one was electromicron uh, scope, view of it, if we look at our graphic form, we can see that every one of these circles and curls and things that look like ribbons is going to be moving at a unique rate to every unique species. And the reason why this is important is because we can only assemble the proper proteins and oils for that matter. We'll get into that in a little bit. We can only assemble the proper proper proteins if we have the proper building blocks. And those proper building blocks are going to be 
the foods that we eat. So when we start to look at some of that, this is a common thing that people eat in America, uh, pizza. The, the proteins in that are going to be adulterated in a whole bunch of different ways. One, the crust is commonly not a whole grain. That's one thing. The meat that's on there, it's, it's high fat. It's probably been fed in a feedlot and that changes its, its bending. It changes the frequency of it and that will change what we are able to build. So when you start to see this, this, this is an interesting thing because feeding this will increase the risk of, of breast cancer is one of the one of the results of that. We make all of our protein inside of our cells and what happens is the DNA inside of our cells, it unwinds, it gets copied with messenger RNA and um, this really ties into the COVID vaccination, how this, this works also. But um, it's, it's copied as a mirror image by messenger RNA that gets moved off into the ribosome where it's going to um, build new proteins. As we start to look at that, that happens inside of the cell. The DNA is inside the, the nucleus and the ribosomes are just outside of the nucleus and things are moved out into there. Well, when we don't have the right building block, then things won't fit into the, the part where the proteins are built and it doesn't make them of the proper shape. And with that, it can't make the proper vibration. This is why Time Magazine put an article why your DNA isn't your destiny. The DNA probably will keep the sequence always, but the shape in which it bends and the shape in which it vibrates can be distorted so much that it changes genetic expression. And that study of that is called epigenetics. When we start to look at that, you can start to manipulate genetics by changing DNA. The way we eat has a significant effect on this and it can change things very, very significantly. There is 30,000 potential variations for every gene that we make. And what determines which one of those gets expressed is our lifestyle. And that lifestyle really starts with what we're here eating. So good food and good choices gives good genetic expression. Poor food and poor choices give poor genetic expression. This is really significant in the process of healing because we're either making proteins that express themselves the way they should or we're making proteins that don't. We need to have optimal expression to be able to heal. Protein dysfunction in digestion, protein malnutrition, malabsorption is very, very big in Lyme disease. It's one of the biggest barriers there. Then we look at oils. This is a picture of the cell membranes of every cell inside of us. And inside of the cell, there are membranes also. Those membranes are made up of, of oils. 95% of the cell membrane is oils with a phosphate. That's what those heads are on there. On the left is a really good fluid membrane. They should be able to move and all that. On the right is a very rigid one. When we eat the wrong oils, our cell membranes are very rigid, hyperinflammatory, and unable to function. They need to be fluid like they are on the left for those to be able to function. So that's one thing that oils do in inside of us. 
when we look at the way a lot of people eat deep fried foods and things like this gives a 27 percent increase in breast cancer for every weekly serving that people have they're that significant if it does that's setting people up for when they're older as we're trying to heal from a chronic illness it will direct the path of our immune function uh, inflammatory responses toxic responses different things like this so when we look at nutrition these are the things that are really really key for those who want to heal proteins they make structure and function they comprise about 35 percent of our brain structure they make up all the enzymes inside of us and they make all the interactive sites inside of a cell oils are 95 percent of the cell membranes 48 percent of the brain structure and they're the building block of all of our hormones determines the inflammatory state of the entire body and when you look at people with lyme disease inflammation is a huge huge issue people are making big huge words uh, about inflammation so they can joke a lot of people in but they're ignoring what's causing it what's what's really the mechanism behind it and you you can't resolve the inflammation until you can figure out what's going on with it so carbs are fuel they're energy complex carbs those are healthy um, they're they're full of protein full of fiber the fiber slows the absorption the protein helps normalize the blood sugars simple carbs are naked um, they absorb very rapidly and they cause extreme inflammatory responses along with hormonal dysregulation vitamins they're part of every body process that's a key part of of enzymes minerals those are coenzymes are part of every single body process also and water 60 to 75 percent uh, of what our body is made up of virtually all of our body processes take place inside of water so the water we take in is really key most people are on city water city water has chlorine a whole bunch of other things chlorine will destroy the gut wall and it it kills the bacteria inside of the gut which is a key component of health they were if you look out there a lot of people are selling mineralized waters and all that we can't absorb rock form minerals that are dissolved in water plants can't either uh, the the microbiota the the bacteria the, and the yeast and fungus in the soils they convert the rock form minerals into phosphates for the plants to be able to absorb the plants absorb and they transport phosphate minerals and in us we can't absorb phosphate minerals we can only absorb minerals in plant form so all the minerals inside of water displace the water and decrease the energy inside of it oh the highest energy water we can drink is steam distilled water the lower the uh, uh, the mineral content the better off we are if we look at oils there's three different classes of oils there's omega threes sixes and nines the omega nines those are those are animal fats or solid room temperature that's where cholesterol comes from and cholesterol is not a bad thing it's a band-aid it's 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 actually good uh, the omega threes those are vegetable oils uh, alpha uh, linoleic acid that depletes one of your key um, fish oils EPA arachidonic acid that creates inflammation and pain when we get down to the omega-3 oils those are fish and seed oils a interesting thing about the uh, seed and the nut oils is those are in the GLA form GLA converts into EPA at a 12 to 14 percent efficiency if you're healthy uh, if you're not healthy it, it's less than that our oils need to go, be converted to EPA EPA will convert into DHEA DHA and EPA are the primary ones we use DHA is really critical for brain nerve function things like that those are anti-inflammatory so if people are trying to get 
their oils from seeds like flaxseed or or nuts they're only at a maximum able to utilize 14 percent of those which it's an 86 percent waste at a minimum of trying to do something it's not an efficient way to do it um, the officials are what make the membranes of our cells real fluid and it also normalizes hormones so this is a chart of different kinds of oils right in here you'll notice that the fish oils the only one that's 100 percent omega-3s the uh there are a few plants that are really high in omega-3s all those are considered weeds and not normally eaten in america um purslane is one of the big ones Flaxseed, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's estrogenic. It disrupts women's hormones as far as um, chronically ill people with Lyme disease. Uh, it, it's rare that anybody can tolerate flaxseed. Um, corn oil is toxic. It's full of all kinds of herbicides and pesticides. The peanut is one of the biggest allergenics oils that's out there if we look at canola it's generally toxic to the only oils that really are worthwhile eating especially if you're ill is is fish oils you can't cook with those um extra virgin olive oil trader joe's is the cheapest cleanest extra virgin olive oil we know of some people can do safflower oil and avocado oil can be fairly decent so we go back to this the oils are setting up an inflammatory response inside of us and one, once we have a chronic illness we can't handle the extra inflammatory issues going on so that's part of the reason why this creates sets people up to have cancer when they're older so when we look at at nutrition there's a few principles to live by so that people can actually be healthy proteins if we're doing animal proteins they should be grass-fed and grass-finished uh, grass-fed doesn't mean a lot grass-finished means that they don't have grain they weren't grain grain is typically toxic and, and it creates inflammatory fats in the meats it disrupts their hormones it disrupts the oil levels in them uh, grass-fed meats have a high amount of fish oils or omega-3s in them whereas grain-fed don't um, other ways to get whole proteins is combining grains and legumes grains and nuts legumes and nuts or three grains together um, complete gr uh, proteins if people want to be vegetarian soy is an option it should be fermented if you really want to use that mushrooms are complete proteins buckwheat and quinoa quinoa should be organic the non-organic uh, we've had people have some real major hyperinflammatory problems with that as far as carbs go they should be whole foods only uh, sugar is one of the biggest problems when you go to uh, Lyme support groups you you get around different people doing different diet issues sweets are always part of that sweets will destroy your ability to heal and um, the artificial sweeteners they're all neurotoxins the, the the substitute ones like stevia stevia feeds pathological stuff inside of you it's not good xylitol most of that's made off of corn it's toxic it, it, it you just can't get around it and once you get off of sugar for a little while you your taste buds really change and, and you really appreciate a lot of things berries are a pretty good option as far as that goes so with the carbs we want whole foods only squashes root vegetables whole grains are a good idea the nightshades like potatoes um, hyperinflammatory not many people with chronic illness can do the nightshades when you look at vegetables <clears throat> this is a real key 
every society that has a long lifespan has a high vegetable intake. And vegetables should be pretty much 50% of every plate of food that we eat, five colors in a day. It's good to have five colors of vegetables in in every meal that you do. It really makes it a lot more attractive when you do that. And then the key with greens, <clears throat> like dark leafy greens, things like spinach, chard, beet greens, collard greens, things like that, that's where we get all of the nutrients, all of the minerals to drive this electromagnetic building inside of us to make health. And it's all driven by uh, a few different minerals in, in different ratios and all that. Those are very, very healthy when we start to do that in greens. Herbs are real key. Herbs are what make food taste really good. They're antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, they're antimicrobial. They, they're phenomenal on what they do. Spices, the same thing. They, they add flavor to food. They, they make food to be a lot of fun. It's really exciting. They're antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, oftentimes antimicrobials, antifungals. So the more spices you can put in, the more herbs you can put in what you cook, the healthier most societies are. And a caveat to that, if people eat spicy food, hotter food, the, the heat inside of like peppers is, granted it is a nightshade family, but very, very few people respond negatively to peppers. The, if you really want to stimulate your immune system, Hot peppers are, are really key. They, they do a lot of phenomenal things. They knock off inflammation. They decrease pain levels. They help clear toxins. They clear the gut. Um, they're somewhat antiparasitic. And then water is, or liquids, that's really a, a key issue. We talked about that a little bit before. Distilled water is the highest energy water that there is steam distilled it quenches your thirst like nothing you've ever had before when you have it herbal teas can be really good as far as that goes the mineral waters they, they the minerals displace the water it makes it so you can't absorb very well and when you start to drink things like distilled water your thirst gets quenched in a in a huge way so and coffee is one of the biggest beverages all over the world. The one thing with coffee and caffeine, coffee and caffeine have beat up the adrenals. Everybody with Lyme disease, chronic Lyme especially, has adrenal issues. Their hormones or hormonal axis is going to be dysregulated in a huge way. So it's best to avoid caffeine, chocolate, coffee, things like that till the drains are real healed up. And then we can oftentimes introduce that back in moderately. One key about coffee, coffee is one of three most toxic crops in the world uh, as far as consumption goes. What we consume it is the most toxic crop consumed in the world. Close to 27 different toxins in it. It should be organic only when people have it. and people that can't get away from it, an organic water process decaf can be a pretty good option as far as that goes. Most of the vitamins out there are too poor a quality to do any good. The uh, attorney general in the state of New York did a study on several different uh, major retailers. There was Walmart, Target, Walgreens, and GNC. They took their herbal supplements, analyzed them. Uh, about 90% of the products they pulled off the shelf in those companies did not have a trace of what was on the label inside of them. The quality of supplements is, is really key on being able to heal. Most of the things you can get uh, your multiple uh, multiple level marketing companies, those are never over a medium grade 
the, most of the really good ones are professional supply only. Fish oils, a uh, key thing with that, 75% of the fish oils on the shelf are rancid before you buy them. If they're not in the refrigerator, they're going to be rancid. They'll be a little bit bitter. We've tested fish oils in every store, market, uh, professional supply all over the country for many, many, many years. Uh, there's only one that we really recommend out of that, and that you can get through our store. It's called Omega Co3 from Apex. It's, it is by far the best that's out there. Um, most of the fish oils are, um, they have lemon in them, and people with chronic illness can't tolerate lemon. The, the seed oils are a waste, they're estrogenic, they help disrupt uh, people's hormones and the minerals we don't do absorb in rock form, chelated only, and that's plant form. So we will step from nutrition into the next step is uh, detoxification. One of the key issues with detoxification is proper elimination. We, we need to drink 50% of our weight in water a day at a minimum. People with adrenal issues, that's not enough. And they'll have to do more. Women should urinate at least eight times a day, men five. With bowel habits, three to five is normal across the world. When people have that, they have no bowel uh, pathology, no, bowel, no gut disease whatsoever. Two times daily is a minimum to be uh, acceptable one to two fingers in width six to nine inches long is fairly average um, people need to be excreting pretty close to two feet of bowel a, a day to to be healthy that's all regulated by our vegetable intake not our grains our vegetable intake so if you if your bowel habits aren't up to the snuff increase your vegetable intake quite a bit uh, one of the key issues with healing is is the colon. The bowel is pretty much the focal point of healing. Healing will follow the health of the colon. So it's, it's absolutely vital. And this is only one part of detoxification. I'll get into some more of that a little bit later. So when we start to look at digestion, this is really key. Uh, for every aspect of Lyme disease. This is looking at a, a graphic picture of, of kind of how the, the gut works. If we look at the lining of the small intestine, um, the top picture is what the microvilli typically look like. And those little fingers stick up. That increases the surface area of, of the gut from a small tube about the maybe the size of your middle finger that's 30 feet long, uh, the, the surface area with those microvilli is the size of an Olympic-sized tennis court. So it's really huge what it does. And the, uh, the microbiota, there's a bacterial coating that coats the, all of our mucous membranes. Some call it the flora, some call it the microbiota, and I'll use those two terms interchangeably. That all hides in between those and covers over the surface of it. The microbiota does a large part of our digestion. When there's chronic inflammation in the gut, those microvilli, they atrophy base down to the basal layer. And those dark circles right at the bottom of those, that's your lymph glands. That's about where half your immune system is inside of the gut right in there. When there's chronic inflammation inside of the gut, uh, the, the microvilli, the atrophy, the, there's no place for the microbiota to, to stay, and it overwhelms the immune system, and the immune system becomes hyperactive, uh, enlarges a huge amount, and stagnates the circulation inside of the gut. When we look at inflammation from a microscopic standpoint, it literally blows holes in the surface. And when it blows holes, it pretty much leaks like a sieve. So there you have the leaky gut side of what's going on. If we look at this more of a, uh, a depiction picture right here, that the tight junctions, that's how um, the cells in, on the lining of the gut should hook up. They should be really close together. And that forces everything inside of the gut to 
go through the cells, not in between them. When there's chronic inflammation, those tight junctions start to open up like you see in the upper right side, and things can go in between the cells. That creates a scenario where, where there can be a hyperinflammatory response goes down in the basal layers, which creates what we just saw before. This is more of a, a picture of how the gut should look like, where uh, the bottom layers, that's, that's muscle that makes everything move. The middle layer, the submucosa, that's where the blood vessels, nerves, there's a whole nervous system inside of the gut, and all the lymphatic system is inside the, the submucosa, mucosa is the lining right in there. When, when there's chronic inflammatory responses inside of the gut, which most people with Lyme disease have that, those microvilli, all those fingers, they start to atrophy. The, the mucosa uh, atrophies, the submucosa gets really, really thick and, and it's, it's just completely dysfunctional. One of the co-infections of Lyme disease, rickettsia, is a bacterial um, parasite and that bacteria will go live inside of epithelium. Epithelium is what lines um, the, our skin is epithelium. It, it's, it's the lining of things. It typically, the rickettsia typically go into the lining of the gut and the lining of the blood vessels. Um, along with other things, and that, that can be a, a really a huge factor. So when we look at proper digestion, there's a bunch of things that need to happen. We need to be quiet at rest and at peace. The gut needs to be able to move freely. It's actually tied to a cord that's pretty close to behind your navel, and everything moves around that so it doesn't tie itself in knots like some other animals. Our horses are really bad as far as that goes. Um, some of the things that help keep things moving is exercise. Learn that with raising horses. And when they get colic, their gut starts to tie in a knot. You got to get them moving or, or they can die. Um, same thing with us. Abdominal breathing is a really big part of that. Food, we need to chew to liquid. Um, I've been told that the average amount of times a person chews per bite is about four times when we're eating dinner tonight. I took a large bite of a stir fry and I counted that I chewed 60 times before I had the whole thing swallowed. So <clears throat> that's like 15 times what, what the average is. But when we chew properly, it breaks the food up so it's easier to digest. And everybody with chronic illness is going to have digestive problems. There just are. It mixes the food with uh, saliva, which lubricates it. And there's also a uh, enzyme in the saliva called amylase. So it helps start to digest the, um, the carbohydrates. And then it stimulates the production and the secretion of digestive juices farther down into the stomach, small intestine, and all that so we can digest properly. When we don't chew, those things don't happen. So drinking smoothies, protein drinks, things like that, it bypasses the chewing issue, which doesn't turn on the digestive juices, and that creates an inflammatory issue. So smoothies are a great thing. When people want to do that, they should chew just go through the motions of chewing to stimulate everything down below. The stomach, uh, it, in the stomach, uh, the food mixes with acid, and that's pro proportional to the amount of protein and oils that go into the stomach. Oils are the last thing to em empty the stomach, and it'll actually make the stomach acid get the highest. Acid, it breaks down proteins. It stimulates, as it comes out, the pancreas to release bicarbonate to neutralize the, um, the acid. <clears throat> it also stimulates the upper part of the small intestine to release the hormones to start digestion. One of those hormones is cholecystokinin that tells the gallbladder to release bile if there's a lot of acid in it. It also tells the gut to start moving because there's more food coming into it. And that's where you start to get the urges to go to the bathroom. In the small intestine, uh, everything mixes with enzymes, bicarbonate, bile, and starts to digest. The, the microbiota do a large part of the digestion in the small intestine, a very large part. The mi microbiota, the, um, it, it's like fermenting anybody that lives on a farm, they'll do um, 
forget the word. They'll, they'll ferment a lot of the food supply for, for their animals. And that's what silos are all about. That increases the, uh, the protein content in the food because of all the microbiota that are there. And it partially digests it, so it makes it a lot easier. Um, the microbiota, it ferments food that's adding protein. It also will add some aldehydes, and that can be a problem if the microbiota is not healthy. And the microbiota also make every hormone that we make in our body and every neurotransmitter that we make in our body. So the microbiota is really, really critical for people with chronic illness. When you start to see the brain fog that goes on, the hormonal dysfunction that's going on, it's it's a really, really big part of it. Um, and the microbiota, it communicates with the brain. It helps control the brain. And in that way, it helps direct every body function we have inside of us. The microvilli, those are the, on the surface that holds the microbiota. That's the place where nutrients are supposed to absorb. The colon, is its job is to concentrate, absorb water, vitamins, and minerals. The key thing with all of this is in the microbiota that's in the colon, which is where most of it is, the microbiota in the colon determine whether we're going to excrete our toxins or recycle them, recirculate them, especially with hormones. So that, that's, a, that's a really, really key issue. That's part of the reason why the colon is so crucial in uh, the ability to heal. So we look at another key component of digestion is the liver. That's also the detoxification gland. If we look at this picture, all the purple coming off the, off the gut here is the venous return that all goes straight to the liver. It doesn't go to the heart, it goes to the liver. And there's a reason why, why that's there. The liver has a bunch of really key jobs. It's supposed to catch and destroy bacteria and pathogens, store food sources, make sugar from protein when we're stressed, clears the body of toxins, makes bile, and it assembles proteins. Well, there's ways where we can st start to overwhelm that. If we look at Lyme disease, the number one therapy, uh, medical therapy for, for addressing this is uh, doxycycline, which is a very, very strong, broad-spectrum antibiotic. Navina Zubsevec, uh, the Lyme spokesman for Harvard, speaking at Martha's Vineyard Hospital a few years back, said some very, very key things. One of the key things that she, she's a Lyme liaison for Harvard. So she goes around and trains people about Lyme disease. What she said about doxycycline is doxycycline does not kill Lyme disease. That's right. That's what Harvard says. It does not kill Lyme disease. They only hope to use it to keep it from multiplying. And whenever you threaten the, the Lyme bacteria, their smart bacteria, they, they uh, go in defense mode, they interlace kind of like a, a, a woven mat, leak out a substance and make a biofilm that antibiotics and the immune system is in, cannot penetrate. So when you understand that, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, of the therapy, and, and it sets up a risk factor for yeast infections. It's it's one of the most common common causes of it. And big pharma and the the powers to be have always known it's just a generally accepted risk factor of using it. Well, in a real bad case. Actually, it's not a bad case. The, um, the broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, a couple of doses can totally destroy the microbiota in the entire gut. So I've been asked before, can you take flora and do antibiotics at the same time? They're, no, it's, it's, it's pointless. You're just throwing money down the toilet. But when it 
destroys uh, the uh, the healthful bacteria. That's what keeps everything in check because there's there's like a, a big community of of bugs in the gut. There's there's bacteria in there. There's more bacteria in the gut wall than there are are uh, human cells in the rest of the body. There's also yeast in there. There's parasites in there, and there's viruses in there and the microbiota keeps all that in check well when you kill that with broad spectrum antibiotics it sets you up for extreme cases of yeast infections this is beyond yeast yeast has four different forms yeast mold fungus and fungal parasite and you look at the forums out there all the people are talking about uh, chronic inflammatory response issues, uh, mast cell response issues, yeast, mold, and fungus issues. This is one of the biggest reasons why it is. When a gut looks like this, it can't function right. And it has to be addressed and addressed very aggressively. If you try and address that with pharmaceuticals, they're all toxic to the liver. The liver's already overwhelmed with toxins. It can't deal with it. Um, very, very few people know how to deal with three out of the four forms. Almost all of the literature out there, the Candida Connection, that uh, book that was written many years ago, only deals with the yeast form. They don't deal with the mold, fungus, and fungal parasite form. The fungal parasite form, that's when the uh, those little feeding tubules called mycelia start to penetrate the body cavity. So when you have had therapies like that, it makes the the gut lining go from what's on the left, nice and healthy, to what it is on the right, completely inflammatory. And we look again to see what the depiction of that looks like. Once again, on, on the outside, on the, on the far left, you have tight junction between the, the cells that line the gut. Up in the top, you see these holes where these huge things are able to sneak through there. Well, the gut brain axis or gut brain connection you have the same tight junctions in the blood vessels in the brain and only supposed to let certain things into the brain whenever the gut leaks within two hours the brain will leak if you traumatize the brain and make the blood vessels in the brain leak like a concussion an infection a a good blow to the head um toxic reaction there all that will open up the blood vessels in the brain within two hours the tight junctions open up inside the gut so that's the gut brain axis that's what creates all of that and really have to address all those things <clears throat> so when we start to look at the effects of the parts of the yeast mold and the fungus all the feeding tubules are built out of chitin chitin is impervious to the immune system and um, it means the immune system can't touch it. So there's nothing that the immune system can actually do when you have a, a really bad uh, yeast infection that turned into fungus, fungal parasite, or mold. So you need to come at that from outside. And when we look at that, the... Uh, um, we, we've seen that the the permeability or the the, the amount that the, the gut can leak can be affected by different pathogenic issues. Well, one of the big um, pathogenic byproducts of, of yeast is acetylaldehyde, and we're going to get into that a while later. It, it creates all kinds of tremendously terrible things. As it leaks, it starts to let parts of bacteria into the bloodstream. Uh, one of those parts is called LPS, lipopolysaccharides. It's part of some gram-negative bacteria. And <clears throat> what that does is it makes super antigens for your immune system, and it creates autoimmune responses. So now we have Lyme disease, we have gut dysfunction, we have toxic things started to clear from the normal course, and now we have autoimmune issues going on. When we, when we look at the way that most people eat, this is a study where they put 
people on a, on a, just a standard American diet for a month. And in a month, they had a 71% increase in plasma levels. So we're not talking about what's in the gut. 71% increase in the plasma levels of toxic release going throughout the body. Um, so if that's almost doubled in the uh, throughout the body, that's gone through the gut, the immune system in the gut, gone through the liver, the immune system in the liver, trying to catch and deal with all that. And the liver tries to dump that back into the gut with a bile. It's gone through all of those processes and still a 71% increase in spillover. So the toxic levels inside of the gut have to be astronomical. Um, then we look at some of the foods we put in there. Uh, this whole issue of GMO is just a wagging the dog to keep people off of really understanding what's going on. The GMO foods uh, are too weak to fight things off and the way they farm, they don't feed the soil. Plants need healthy soil with healthy nutrients. They need the same nutrients we need. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you study all that. But to try and bump up production to get a little bit more boost into the kernel of the wheat and to be able to harvest it when they want, they spray wheat. 95% of the hard wheat crop is sprayed with Roundup two to three days to three weeks max just before it's harvested. So that's in all of our food supply and Roundup destroys the microbiota, destroys the microvilli. Um, Firstly, all of the grains in America are harvested that way. So what we eat is, is just a huge factor. Then the seed aldehyde that um, the yeast and all that comes from typical therapies. It, it has a byproduct called, uh, it, it makes different aldehydes and that's some of the character of ale types of beers and the lagers they try and get away from having the aldehydes. But one of the things with one of the, the byproducts is acetylaldehyde. Acetylaldehyde kills the nerves inside of the gut and in the brain to make dopamine. Dopamine's our feel-good hormone. So once you start to kill those, it's no wonder why people are so miserable. They have no hope of feeling better because their ability to make dopamine is gone. And when we look at this, the acetylaldehyde is seven times more toxic than formaldehyde in bombing fluid. So we look at all that, and then we put another layer together with this. Um, this is uh, this is the hormone function right here, and. Everybody's heard of the HPA axis. This is what's going on with HPA axis. The hypothalamus is the H part. It's just above the brainstem, which is just above where the neck meets the head, just barely inside. It reads the levels of hormones, gases, minerals, and other processes in, inside of the body. It communicates with hormones primarily to the pituitary, which is very, very, very close. It'll send signals, little hormone signals, the pituitary on whether hormone levels are good, bad, or indifferent. If they're good, keep doing it, what it, it should. If they're too high, decrease it. If they're too low, increase it. Well, in the case of the thyroid, it sends off TSH to the pituitary. That uh, TSH, uh, comes actually uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone comes out of the hypothalamus. The pituitary sends out TSH to that tells the thyroid to stimulate and make a hormone called thyroxine, which is inert. Thyroxine gets converted in the peripheral tissues. About 75% of the conversion is in the muscles and turns into T4, T3, T2, and T1. T3 is, is the primary one where it uh, is used to monitor things. One thing with, we go back into what we're talking about, the protein and all that, the teeth, all those conversions can happen in regular or reversed. Reversed is inert. 
years ago, we had somebody we were working with that uh, was seeing us and a medical doctor, and and they were looking at thyroid, and their their um, tests were pretty dysfunctional. They finally, after a year, did ours, and we found the reverse T3 was almost 200 times what the regular one was. It was no wonder why the problem is. But um, the thyroid and the adrenal are are very, very, very susceptible to um, toxic responses. The thyroid, it, it pretty much it determines our metabolic rate without our energy burn, without our weight. is 50% of a woman's cycle. When women start to have cycle problems, bleeding problems, hemorrhaging problems, half of that uh, on, on average is thyroid, um, is the cause of that. This is what the thyroid typically controls it's your mitochondria that's the energy powerhouses inside the cells this is what a healthy one looks like this is what one looks like when they're dying when they've had too much toxic exposure so mitochondrial support uh, is pretty dysfunctional unless you can find what the hormones are what the toxins are and start to clear them this is how the mitochondria start to make um, energy and Let's see here. I, I just uh, I lost there. There I'm back. Okay. I just opened up the Q and A. So anybody that's got questions, I'll try and answer those. Um, just go ahead and post them. Um, the um, uh, this is the primary area. The purple spot is where we make most of our energy, and that's all in the mitochondria. Then we start to look at adrenal issues. Um, the adrenals, they are our stress glands. They control inflammation, immune response, stress, blood sugar, kidneys, and posture, blood pressure. They regulate basically by the same thing with the hypothalamus through the anterior pituitary to, to make cortisol. Well, <clears throat> when anybody's had chronic inflammatory issues, chronic illness issues, this dysregulation is going on, and the adrenals are putting out too much cortisol to begin with. Too much cortisol will make a man start to look like this, a classic issue of uh, a cortisol response. The fat starts to deposit in the visceral organs and makes a sagging, hanging abdomen like that. Man boobs are a huge part of that. Well, when the adrenals are going wide open like that, there's some called a, a progesterone steel. And there's, uh, um, with the adrenals, uh, they, they make cortisol, and they also make the precursors to our sex hormones, as DHEA and pregnenolone. The, in, when we're functioning normally, about half goes to each side. Well, when we're in chronic inflammatory state or chronic alarm state, all of the the precursors to make our sexual hormones get shunted over to make cortisol. So we don't have very much precursors to make our sexual hormones at all. And when you add to that, the increase in cortisol, that makes the blood sugar start to rise. Tells the liver to convert the sugars into, um, convert the amino acids into sugars to raise your blood sugar up so you can defend your life, that makes insulin rise. Well, when insulin starts to rise in the presence of cortisol, it tells the fat to turn on a hormone. There's about 27 different hormones in fat. Aromatase is one of those. Aromatase takes a normal men circulating testosterone, turns it into toxic estrogens. It takes women circulating estrogens, turns them into toxic estrogens and testosterone. And this is part of the HPA dysregulation axis where you have such hormonal issues. Women are a lot more keyed into their hormones than men. Men just, um, they function different with a woman's cycle. She's forced to have to take notice where a man doesn't necessarily, but once you start to get the hormonal dysfunction, you start to have general atrophy in males and females, uh, women, you start to have all the cyclical issues. You start to have 
changes in the production of cervical fluids, sexual interaction can become very, very painful, and it's, it, it becomes a nightmare. That can be resolved uh, fairly well. We had one young lady come in one, one time, and she asked me, what do you do to me? And I said, well, what are you talking about? She came in with her husband. Her husband's sitting back in a chair. He's kind of smug. And she goes, you turned me into an effing nymphomaniac. And I go, what? What are you talking about? She says, I used to hate sex. It hurt. It's always hurt. I, I just hated it. Absolutely hated it. But what you've done with me, man, it, it, it doesn't hurt anymore. It actually feels good. I can't get enough. And, and it was really funny. Her husband's kind of beaming and she's, she's just completely changed her life. Um, and this is a nightmare that really isn't addressed uh, throughout all the line forums and all that. We put a question out um, quite a while back on, on what people would like to see addressed in, in a book. We were, I was writing a book on Lyme disease and that was one question. So we put a chapter in that. Um, it's a pretty major book. It's called Breaking the Chronic Nightmare of Lyme Disease Without Crashing, Herxing, or Feeling Worse. And it's there. I, I don't believe there's anything like it. So we come back to this detox issue right here. Um, to properly detox, I mean, it's a buzzword. We all know it's a buzzword. To properly detox out there, um, you, you, you can't do it with the first, without first identifying what the toxin is. Um, we've, we've had people respond to everything. Um, we had somebody traveling that had major, um, major response. They went in the gas station. Uh, somebody was pumping diesel in the pump next to him and, and the person just had a total meltdown because that was one of the toxins that they were highly reactive to and the person who was driving didn't know that and you know and to sort that out on the road it was it, it was a pretty major scene you can't clear a toxin unless you know what it is so all these um, promotions of, of detox programs um, there, there is a good way to sell a gimmick, but it really doesn't do that much good. You have to be able to identify what the toxin is, where is it deposited, what organ is it deposited in, what's the source, where did it come from, is it airborne, did it come through the lungs, is it foodborne, did it come through the gut, is it a response because the gut and the liver the detoxification pathways are plugged and it's making things worse. The phase one detoxification actually makes things more toxic. Phase two makes them excretable. So pathological detoxification is a elevated, uh, a very functional phase one and a very dysfunctional inhibited phase two. That's a pathological toxic um, detox pathway. And, and to try and run somebody through a tox, detox program without addressing that could be uh, an absolute nightmare, really, really could. The phase one detox that goes through the cytochrome P450 um, phase, the, the interesting thing, I found this in a minor article a while ago, the whole mechanism that our intestine absorbs nutrients through is the cytochrome P450 phase. It's been long known that with pharmaceuticals, you got to really increase the dosage because it gets denatured in the gut. The reason why it gets denatured in the gut is because the cytochrome P450 in the gut is detoxifying the pharmaceutical when you bring it in. So that, that typically occurs in the gut and in the liver. Phase two, um, that's the conjugation. That's when something gets added to it so it becomes water soluble and excretable that happens in the liver and the microbiota throughout the gut so this is part of the way the microbiota determine whether we're going to excrete or recycle our hormones and then the process is very nutrient dependent uh, it requires vitamins minerals oils nutrients proteins um, 
are, are really, really critical, and those can change depending on which toxin it is and which tissue. And then if it's a tissue that's distant from the gut, uh, say it's in the brain with a, with a foggy brain, then, then you have to figure out what kind of substance will transport it, pull it out of the brain and get it back to liver where it can be cleared. So we start to look at, um, at addressing this. One of the issues with addressing an autoimmune process can be, it can be fixed, it can be stopped by fixing the gut barrier, which when you fix the gut barrier, that also fixes the brain barrier and along with all that. With, with the gut barrier, you can't fix the gut barrier without addressing the microbiota. So we add to all this chronic Lyme. Last time I looked up, Borrelia is, is the Lyme bacteria. There were at least 300 strains. Uh, I, I could not find um, no, no lab that knows what they are will even acknowledge to a doctor how many there are. You can't find out, not through the CDC, not through the CDC's labs, not, no place, can't find out. If you don't know a good researcher that has inroads, you won't know. <clears throat> so there's at least 300 strains, 30,000 potential strains. Um, smart bacteria, once it gets inside, it can read your proteins and copy them within two hours. As soon as it copies your protein, your immune system recognizes it as you and leaves it alone. So when you look at you know, different approaches to try and address Lyme disease, um, that's ignored. That's highly ignored. Anything that's gonna stimulate the immune system uh, when a person is full of biofilms and colonies of bacteria hiding in biofilms that have read your protein, copied your protein to stimulate the immune system is going to do nothing, absolutely nothing, um, without addressing other things first. But BCA, it's probably the biggest co-infection. Uh, I'll, I'll make this statement, never seen a case of Lyme disease where Lyme was the only issue. And the real, real key with all of it, why was the body too weak to fight things off in the first place? Because we're made in an amazing way and we should um, um, we should be able to fight things off. I, I, I just saw one, uh, one question in there. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. The, uh, the Babesia, it's a parasite that climbs inside of red, red blood cells and it eats them from the inside out, creates anemia. It's, all these things are really impossible to diagnose the, the accuracy of the labs. They used to post these, Igenix used to post this many years ago. Uh, it was zero to 20% if you did the test within the first one to two weeks. And that's pretty much the case of all of these different infections. So it's, it's you'll catch it with some different shapes and sizes of, of blood cells on blood smear, and that's about as good as, as you'll do. There's other ways to test it, and we, we use other other means. Rickettsia, as I said before, that's a bacterial parasite that climbs inside the linings of your blood vessels, your gut, all of that, and disrupts everything. When it disrupts the lining of your blood vessels, the, uh, the cells, they tumble instead of just slide down, and it creates can really become a, a real nightmare, along with creating all inflammatory issues in the uh, in the gut and making a leak worse. Ehrlichia, it's a bacterial parasite that invades your immune cells and disables those so they can't function. That's pretty interesting that a bacteria can climb inside of our immune system and disable it, but that's pretty common. Viruses, there's multiple strains out there. Uh, they all weaken the immune system and, and other functions. Then we had parasites on top of that, Bartonella. There's a lot of press about Bartonella. It's not nearly as common as what people are led to believe. Um, 
it seems to be more of a marketing thing and it doesn't appear that it's transfers the same way it's it's a lot like trichomonas which is considered a um a venereal disease the most common carrier of trichomonas is cats bartonella is the same thing the most common carrier is cats anaplasmosis is a class of reaction that creates granulomas uh reactions to them and uh there's worms with those h pylori giardia there the list is endless that really needs to be assessed to be able to go forward with things like this when we look at the the tests the western blots the biggest test that's out there it's promoted as b0 to 20 percent accurate it's the longest test out there six to eight weeks of any kind of accuracy tom greer one of the premier lyme researchers in the world cites some studies where they did blood draws 517 blood draws on people and um they sent those they took three blood samples from everybody sent them to different labs they labeled them really careful tracked where they went sometimes one lab would get three samples sometimes three labs would get one sample out of the 517 blood samples no two results were the same tom Greer says that that's just an outrage it should be outlawed so when we look at the key to healing most people are trying to find a diagnosis and diagnosis is a is a is a key issue um but if if the the direction of care is going to go off a diagnosis all people are going to get is a protocol diagnosis leads to a manual manual tells you how to address things and those addressings always have complications it compartmentalizes and leaves out key issues and that's why people aren't getting better you have to take a different approach uh, i put this as a health model approach where you really gotta uh, from from my own studies in my own uh interaction with people and we dealt with hundreds of people with lyme disease um why they got sick in the first place is real key and as far as the tick goes you can forget that the, the literature shows it's in two to three percent of the blood supply in minnesota and wisconsin it's in the sexual fluids in men and women it's transferred by mosquitoes spiders um gnats deer flies anything that bites can transfer it anything that transfers fluid from one living organism to another can transfer all of these so the tick really isn't an issue it's not at all uh, we had one guy come in who bit, bit by a deer fly second time got lyme disease for the second time went to the hospital he told me he was nuts he went back to urgent care told uh, the nurse and she goes well if that's true you're only the fifth one this week from a deer fly and he 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 killed the deer fly and he brought the deer fly with him so you got to address all of these factors i'm talking about at the same time you can't compartmentalize them people just can't heal that way you can't trickle in and do this that or the other thing you have to deal with them all at the same time so you got to deal with the gut nutrition find out food intolerances what the mi microbiota is what needs to be healed the colon center healing it's critical to get elimination going the earlier the better and deal with with everything liver it has to function properly it's very nutrient dependent uh, mineral dependent and that's a key for toxic clearance and the infunction and all that um, hormones the dysregular hormones they're reacting they're not a primary issue you can't throw hormones at hormone dysfunction and expect anything you got to clear out the reason why they are not um regulating properly the brain access which which is leaking first uh is, is there infection up in the brain um that that's really key the detox is a secondary issue also you've got to figure out what where when why how what's clogging it before you can really detox immune it's also a secondary issue and uh, why somebody's too weak 
to to be able to fight this off in the first place. And then you, after that, then you can start to look at all the infective issues. So somebody's got one question. Um, um, and that is, what about um, coconut oil? And with coconut oil, um, it is highly estrogenic. It disrupts the estrogen in inside of people. Rarely do we see people that it's good for. And I know that's a really big thing in the keto industry, but rarely is it good for anybody. Um, anybody else got any questions? I'm going to make an offer to you guys. If anybody wants to to have a good look at what's going on with them, um, I put up a link, and I'm seeing it in my screen, but I'll, I'll put it up um, again in a little bit because it covers everything. If, um, if anybody wants to have a really good look at what's going on with them, I'm going to make an offer that they can go to our website on the Ready to Talk page and fill out the paperwork. The more detail you give me, the, the better it is. I'll give them a free consultation on that. No, that'll last. I'll, I'll let that hold for for just a little while. Um, normally, I charge for those. and But just for people who, who attended, I'm going to give that offer. And that offer should be up, but on my screen, I don't see it. So I'm sure that this was a different approach than what everyone was expecting, but it really deals head on with all of the issues that need to be dealt with. And as I said before, the only way to really heal from this is to address all these. Uh, looking out at other people when it's you know I, studying diagnostic issues how, how you can really figure out what's going on with Lyme disease got a hold of some of the best docs um some of the biggest names out there got a hold of their test kits uh their treatment regimens and all that and most of them were junk ended up throwing them all away they were they were totally worthless we had to come up with pretty much our own thing on how to address this. And when you talk to people, uh, talk to doctors that work with Lyme disease, they all skirt around issues of what, how long, what was the expectations. Uh, we're pretty open with what we see. We have over a 90% restoration to health of the people we work with and of the people who follow what I have them do, they all get better. They all get healthy. And I, I don't think there's another doc out there that can honestly say that. And I'm not saying that because they went through and we have a graduation day and they, they hit graduation day and that's when they're, they're found to be clean that graduation day that remains years down the road. We got a young gal that was born with Lyme disease, totally dysfunctional, couldn't think, couldn't thrive. The um, social services were threatened to be called and yank her out of her home. She was homeschooled uh, because since the docs couldn't make her any better, they wanted to blame the parents and wanted to say she, they were depriving her, making her, uh, starving her, and different things like that. So she ate things that were toxic to her, made her puke, did, did all kinds of stuff. She she hadn't psyched. She, yeah, she hadn't cycled for, for over a year when she came in to us. She was, I think, 17 and 98 pounds, skinny as a rail. And when, when she started to heal, she kept asking me, so what am I going to look like when I'm, when I'm done with this, we have no idea. Um, you're going to look like you're supposed to because your body's starting to heal, starting to normalize. But what that normal is, no one's known because you've never been healthy. And 
um, and she healed up. She headed off halfway across the country to go to college. Met a pretty neat young man, got engaged, got married, and they're a couple of years down the road. They're one of the happiest married couples we know of. And, uh, and she, she just posted her celebration of her sixth year of being healed from Lyme disease. So that's really common with us. People ask, so how long does it take to um, uh, start to feel any different? And honestly, that can be days. Some people, it's literally less than a week. Most people are starting to be, feel significantly different within a couple of weeks with working with us. So, so that's huge. That's really, really huge. I, I don't know anybody else can really honestly say that. So anybody else have any more questions? Because it looks like everybody's still hanging out. Don't don't be afraid to throw one out. Um, I've got a, a, a pretty deep resource of, of all kinds of different answers, so it really doesn't. Um, it's a good time to get them answered now. Um, okay, so why is lemon not good? Um, in in the citrus family, there's um, you got grapefruit. Grapefruit should not be eaten by anybody with a chronic illness. There's a protein in grapefruit that shuts down the uh, the ability to de to detoxify. So it shuts the liver down and it, and it won't detoxify. Lemon. Um, I, I I really couldn't cite a literature as to why it's not good. We test everybody that we see on a large array of foods for food re responses. And I can just say across the board, less than 5% of the people we see with chronic illness. And that's one of the things that pretty much specialize in is the worst nightmares out there. They cannot tolerate it. Lime, that's a good option. Lime uh, has all the same benefits that lemon does. It's a higher acid levels and um, okay, the, the paperwork for the consultation, let me see if this, um, uh, it's not going to come up, and I apologize to that. Let me. See if okay. I'll put it here. Okay. This is our website, and you go to. To that tab on the website, paperwork's there. Um, okay, um, the mast cell activation uh, syndrome. If we look at the immune system, um, the immune system is set up to to respond primarily to two different things inside of us: infections and toxins. Now, the only reason why the, um, the mast cells are, are hyperactive, we went through several mechanisms of, of autoimmune issues and upsetting the immune system throughout there. The key with mast cell, um, the uh, mast cells are actually macrophages, which they circulate later around in the blood, and the um, 
they migrate out of the blood, go into the tissues and become mast cells. And you get the histamine reactions along with some other hyperinflammatory things that give you this hyperinflammatory itching response and all that. The, the mast cell activation, we've had several people with that. You can't address the mast cell because mast cell is only responding the way it was designed to. The problem is either infection or toxicity. It's usually a combination of both of those. So when you look at the issue of autoimmune issues, the one, one slide we had uh, about three slides back, um, it lets you know that the autoimmune responses, they start to clear once you start to heal the gut. So in properly dealing with that, that's, that's how you deal with the autoimmune issues like the mast cell is right in there and it, it can clear. Um, another question on mold. Mold is a huge thing. Uh, when we started working virtually, it really opened up a, uh, this huge window with mold. Um, mold is a absolute phenomenal factor. And, and in, in addressing this, the reason why we've been able to do so well with um, mold uh, or with Lyme disease is because of my knowledge base in candida and leaky gut is extensive. That's really what I primarily specialize in. And it's because of that we're able to do that. So <clears throat> there's a bunch of things about mold. There's a bunch of scare tactics out there, uh, a lot of manipulation, a lot of things. It's huge. The, the reason why it's huge is the mold spores and all of the fuzz coming off the mold is made up of chitin, which is impervious to the immune system. And it, the mold spores look very much like pollen, which look like archaic medieval torture devices um, get in, in the lungs and create all kinds of just insane reactions that go on in there. So doing, not only do we work with mold, but in working with people, we can evaluate homes, workplaces, things like that, where mold is with a degree that's incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. We've had skeptics try and trick us up in doing that, try and fool us and, and do a lot with that. Um, and the, yeah, they walk past some place and go, well, where you're at right now is really good, but where you were a couple steps ago, that was really, really toxic as far as mold goes. Yes, we help localize mold and we have some very creative, very inexpensive ways to deal with it. So that's huge. Um, as far as the heavy metal toxicity and all that, um, one of the big things with heavy metal toxicity is the yeast mold and fungus, fungal parasite, all feed off of heavy metals and they bring heavy metals with them. So when, when that starts to go systemic, when you start to have the yeast infections that go systemic, they carry systemic heavy metals with them. Oh, we have a few different heavy metals that are pretty common. Mercury, most common uh, cause of that is from uh, fillings, primarily. When you look at lead, that's old paints, things like that. Aluminum typically is people's cookware and what they um, what they drink out of cans, especially carbonated beverages out of cans. So the heavy metal is, is another one of those things that's not a primary issue. And there's some very, very creative ways to pull those out that are way, way, way more effective than what most people do. Uh, one of the keys with that, since the yeast mold and the fungus feed off of heavy metals, you can actually use your clearance of yeast and mold to clear the heavy metals much more effectively than any chelation therapy that I've heard of. Um, and it, it clears it really quickly. The key is, is really addressing the candida 
in in the four forms and that's how you deal with the metals in a in an honest very effective way and it's not a not it's not a convoluted process so yeah as far as worth testing for heavy metals we do all of our testing in-house everybody that we test we test for heavy metals um several different kinds and the way that we test is is very creative um extremely accurate and it, when when the lord was telling us to move on we had people we were working with ask us to try and figure out a way to do that at a distance and i've been pretty resistant to that but we started testing different things and we started testing people farther and farther away and and the end of my my split testing we had people blindly on the phone i had no idea who they were we were doing evaluations with them and then we brought them into the office and and the evaluations the the results were 100 percent the same it was very humbling to um to see that because lord just he he lent us a higher degree of accuracy because of the integrity we do stuff so as far as testing for heavy metals we test everybody for everything um we do not just do a test for say lyme disease we evaluate everybody we go through every body system there is uh, figure out what's working right what isn't what the problem is or where where the where the central focus key is how to resolve everything from that. Then we evaluate food intolerances after that. After that, we go into uh, a deeper kit, which is Lyme, heavy metals, toxins, parasites, and all that. So no matter who we work with, everybody gets evaluated with everything. Because you find out after a while, if you do a shortcut, you miss something, and you can't miss things with this been accused of being the most thorough doctor that people in their 80s have ever seen and and i I don't want to change that i don't really want to change that so so yes we 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 work with those we test with those as far as as lab tests for heavy metals only one that has any value is hair analysis the urine analysis um it only catches what's been mobile the last 30 days and heavy metals they don't stay mobile heavy metals they they go and they deposit someplace and they stay there till something mines them out so all your blood tests are completely dysfunctional um and most of the blood tests for uh uh the uh, food intolerances they they only test for two to three percent of the potential responses a person can have they're dysfunctional um the ras test the skin prick test those are two to three percent of the potential responses and when you look at the all the lab tests for lyme disease uh, one for lyme especially it uses a a strain of lyme that was isolated off of a tick they never knew if it was in a human whatsoever and all the tests run off of that there's never been any any testing to see which strain goes in which tissues or what uh what therapy addresses which strain we we have a running history of that in our office of what we find so um the only lab test would be worthwhile would be the hair analysis because of that so these are good questions. Anybody else got anything else? I'll be quiet for a minute and see if anybody else comes up. And if not, then we'll we'll close this off. But you know, I, I really encourage you to uh, to go to the website and pull up the paperwork. As I said, the um, the more detail you can give me, um, the better our consultation will be. Um, okay, question to your patients typically Herx. Herx is commonly a response to um, t- 
toxic release. And the, the reality is um, most of the people we work with don't. The people that have, do have toxic reactions, commonly it's not because of the therapy that we're doing. Um, a, a really common one is they're not hydrated properly. They're not eating properly. They don't have enough calorie, protein, or fiber intake. Their bowel habits are not normal. Those are the primary reasons why the people we work with have any toxic reactions at all. Um, and that's, that's pretty consistent. It, sh it is something that can be avoidable, especially if you trickle therapies in. But what, what we use is, is broad spectrum approaches, broad spectrum products to address a, a multitude of things at the same time. So any more questions? All right, looks like uh, oh, somebody's putting something up. So we'll see what this has to say. Um, it says, can CS help? Um, at the moment, um, I don't remember what CS is. Can you clarify what that is for me? And then I can tell you, I don't remember every acronym that's out there. I, I'm a, oh, colloidal silver. Oh, good, good. I have put the highest quality colloidal silver in my test kit. I couldn't count how many times I put it in just to visit it afresh and see how well that stuff works. Um, I've never found it effective enough to keep it in my test kit. You know, bring it back when, when it comes up, but it's not nearly as effective as the literature has out there. We test the effect of everything. And colloidal silver, for what's going on with this, it's just not powerful enough to, to really do what people would hope it would do. In fact, most of the therapies that are out there that have a name on them are somebody's protocol, somebody's guesswork, and when we test them, they, they just don't work. Just don't work. Um, somebody asks, how often do people have appointments with us? Typically, for the first month, it's weekly. Um, as um, uh, Yeah, it's pretty common for people to say, come back in a month. The, the, I'm a physiology guy, which that, that means I study the way things work and I work with people with that. There are so many changes that go on inside of somebody with, uh, with chronic illness. Um, I mean, chronic illness, it has, has four different factors to it. It's not self-limiting. That means it's not like a cold that just goes away. Um, it gets worse over time. Uh, it involves multiple body systems with it. And one of the key issues with all that is the original cause of what started everything may not be there by the time you see it. So the, the amount of changes that are going on physiologically, uh, you can't keep up with somebody uh, with, with the response that's going on with the chronic illness. If you're doing something healing and you see them in a month, uh, everything in their world could change in a month. That's just not adequate. 
it, it's got to be weekly for for a month and as they start to stabilize then that stretches out so um i think that answers that question that, and that's a really good question um people are seeing people in a month they're guessing we don't guess we test everything and we know exactly what's going on so any other questions? All right, here comes another one. Okay, good. Says thank you. All right. Well, I guess we'll sign off. Um, for those of you who are still on, I, I really encourage you to um, um, go to our website. It, it's up above in the chat. And um, fill out your paperwork. There's a dietary diary in there. It's, it's key. Um, diet's really, really huge. And you... There, there's there's a timeline of what's gone on with you and and parents before you. All those things are really vital factors. The more information you can give, the more specific we can be about what's going on with you. So we'll leave it at that. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, yeah, thank you. Everybody have a good night.